Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the ongoing Southern Waters uh, Creative and Critical Symposium and this session, Flood Ebb. I want to acknowledge that I'm on Paramount land. Many of my colleagues are on Ghana land and some of you are coming in from further, from country further away. I want to acknowledge the custodianship of all the First Nations peoples who've looked after this land for so many thousands of years. And also to acknowledge that they never ceded it. This panel involves a number of writers. I'm very grateful to have you all with us. Um, Michelle Carl, Gail Jones, Jill Jones, Nick Jose, Kim Kruger, Rachel Mead, Jennifer Mills, Lucy Trelaw, and Matt Hooten. And um, what we're going Hello. to do in this session is each writer is going to speak for just a short while, you know, very loosely on this topic of flood ebb. We, we want this to be a kind of a, a very creative space. And then afterwards, we're going to have a conversation. Some of my fellow um, leaders of this panel, Madeline Says, Theodora Galanis, and uh, and Meg Samuelson will um, be asking questions, and I will be too, but I also hope that, that everyone who is speaking, all of the writers will join in and have your own questions. But I think what we'll do first is just have each person speak, and I'm gonna do the tedious thing of largely doing alphabetical order. Um, so Michelle, if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you. You just need to unmute. Mute. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'd like to also acknowledge the Ghana people, uh, the um, whose whose lands we're on, stolen lands that were never ceded, and all First Nations people and people of colour who I stand with in their fight against racism. Um, so yeah, like recently I've been living in Katoomba and when I was invited by Meg and Mandy to participate in Southern Waters, Oceans, it was um, a time of heavy rainfall in New South Wales as the climate shifted from El Nino to La Nina. And the mist in the Jamison Valley, the clouds and waterfalls of the Katoomba River were intoxicating creative drives as I considered the floodplains and the drive west to Broken Hill and to Adelaide as I wondered how I might attend the symposium. As oceans, rivers and waterfalls are magnificent, life-sustaining and life-bearing, mysterious, treacherous, hypnotic soundscapes, energy and alchemy and otherworldly. As a writer, I am drawn to water and its flows and ebbs into my praxis and into the flows of language as material substance Many of my poems have navigated morphologies of water, ice, rain, snow, and elements that act upon and interact with waters. Um, in particular, there were protest poems in my first collection, The Accidental Cage, um, to the political crimes at sea, um, and in um, a later collection, The Herring Lass, of slavery, of refugee deaths, also poems where knowledge derive from knowledges derived from the empirical observations of the waterways of northern New South Wales coastlines, Gurungai country, where I normally live, and um, the islands of the Southern Ocean, where I spent time, King Island and Kangaroo Island, where I was very privileged to spend a few months last year. Uh, so in 2020, um, I walked the coastlines at Vigon Bay on KI, looking west to Point Ellen or east past Seals Beach to Cape Gantham and the bleak Polaris Island. Vigon Bay remains a place of sanctuary where channels of wind and water continue to nourish a vivid biodiversity of habitat, seaweed, fish, crabs, sponges, sea snails, birds, lizards and mammals. The naming and cartography of Yvonne Bay and Cape Gantham, indeed much of the island by Burdan's exploration in 1802 and by Matthew Flinders before him points to a colonial history that has dark shadows. It has been responsible for racist violence 
and the crimes of enslavement, abduction, assault, genocide, as well as ecological trauma and species extinction. As a Kenyan born migrant of Goan Anglo Indian heritage, Viwan Bay offered me a space to walk the sandways and bluffs alert to voices that have been othered and erased, shaping new flows of identity and connection to the endangered animals and to the flora. In this regard, my creative work there on the island resisted the boundaries of nation raised by white Australia. Um, in my more, more recent work, in my novel, Daisy and Wolf, Daisy Simmons is a minor but nonetheless important character in Virginia Woolf's novel, Mrs. Dalloway, and she becomes the engineer of her own destiny via sea journeys in the novel, via the Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea and Suez Canal. But this is also a retelling of the colonial annexation of oceanscapes and the nations that water surrounds within literary texts and the, the consideration of literature as a white colonial um, way of nation forming. Uh, that's kind of all I kind of had space for but there I have also written stories um, that um, uh, a, a wall of water which in which water is considered as as um, a border a bordering um, agent yeah and so uh, some of my poems and stories and fiction do look at the political aspects of water in that way nation building mm -hmm. and how to resist I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you, Michelle. Some some interesting ideas and some that really resonate with some of the things we've been thinking about. Um, okay, I'd like to invite Gail Jones to speak now. Hi, um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this is what a wonderful list of writers you have. Um, I'm also, I'm speaking from the unceded land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, to whom I pay my respects. Uh, when I saw uh, Mandy, Mandy and Meg's questions, uh, they struck me as rather huge. So I have two sorts of answers to offer. The first, I guess, is kind of philosophical. I, my academic training um, inclines me to think of models of the age of empire. Uh, so recognizing oceans as the space of movements of peoples and commodities of exchange, of invasion, of diaspora, of settlement and so on. That is to say, I guess the ocean as a space of utility or of a space instrumentalized by empire. Uh, a territorialized space. Um, however, in the last few years, I've become very interested, like most of you here, I think, uh, in the blue humanities and in the idea of the extraterrestrial as a different kind of cultural and imaginative space. Uh, and, and indeed of the necessity to think about another kind of oceanic imaginary. So, so perhaps something not so much about power, but more to do with energy. So I guess my first response would be to say there's been quite a shift in my own thinking. I'm still very interested in the way oceans were and are made political. And I remember, for example, uh, reading The Black Atlantic. It made such a huge impact on me. Uh, so that kind of text is still very important to me, but I'm also very fascinated by the idea of the space decolonized, so the um, of movement and current conceived of in another model. So something perhaps ineluctable, um, needing another kind of imagining, especially now in this era of catastrophe, since the ocean is in catastrophe. And I note there, there are three images. Um, I'm hoping you can't see me, I don't know, but those three images are from yeah. Joe Derbyshire's work, um, her underwater immersion work, uh, uh, in particular, a, an exhibition called The Floating Life. And you might be able to see that in that central panel, there's the superimposition of a shape that's taken from Edo period Japanese prints. And I'm very interested in the way her work combines this, the sensuality 
of the underwater things drifting, floating, forms of illumination, with the idea that there's another tradition that she's working within that is from the north. So my second response to, to Megan Mandy's question was to think about how as a novelist, it's the image repertoire of oceans of what composes this deterritorialized space that I'm involved with. So I'm, I'm interested in currents and flows in waves and wakes. Um, that, that the whole idea of the wake as the pattern of our afterness or our leaving, so that when one travels on a vehicle over water, there is this pattern in water that is dissolving even as it is made. I find that such a compelling and beautiful uh, image repertoire to consider. Um, immersion, the drowned and the saved is a very important sort of set of tropes for me. Um, I'm interested in the Corollius effect. Um, this is this, this is the effect of wind on water. So we have two systems encircling the earth. We have waves of water, but we have waves and wavelets and undulations and swells and currents within the sky in wind. And the Corollius effect is the way that, that wind pushes or rolls against the ocean. And I discovered this years ago in a book on wind by, um, Oh, what's her name? Uh, Jean de, Jean de Bleu. Uh, she has a whole chapter on the ocean in her book on wind. So that kind of combination of energetic systems that might enable us to think in a more deterritorialized way. These are the kinds of qu questions I'm interested in. And, and those, those forms of um, metaphor that contest uh, Western instrumentalism, if you like. So I suspect that, um, like me, Jennifer Mills has seen the huge clepsydra, I know Nick, I'm sure has, in um, the Forbidden City, the, the six meter high water clock um, of, um, I think it was 1745. The whole idea of time as water uh, is an important consideration for me as well. A time as water, grief as water, the idea of a water clock, that there's another time register that is elemental. And I'll just say one more thing um, by way of introduction, and that is that there's a kind of biographical center to this. Since I, um, as a child in the Kimberleys, I lived in a former quarantine station that was on a peninsula. So there was an omnipresent pulse of the sea. There was a lighthouse, there was. Um, uh, a house permeated by or penetrated by uh, the ocean. Um, I also um, drowned but was resuscitated as a child and this event or this event horizon is at the base of my imagining and I don't actually want to overemphasize this or indeed to say any more about it but in the current context it would be evasive I think not to mention it. And it also bears on what I was talking about in my reading last night, that there is a contradiction here between the space of wonderment, the child. As a child, my brothers and I had goggles, snorkels and flippers, and there were still prodigious coral underworlds to discover. There was still that particularized awareness of the body that I mentioned last night, where the breath is very loud, um, where there are these visual distortions of underwater perspective. So that intuition of contradiction replays and replays in my work. Uh, and it replays in the politicization of drowning as well. So that, how should I put it? Um, the, the body that is lost in the ocean, the cruel loss of a, a location of mourning, uh, now in our century so radically signifies the refugee crisis and refugee anguish, as indeed, I guess, does the idea of islands as the space of incarceration that is now newly, that has a new valency, I think, in our age. Um, so this is a very complicated territory for me. I did once write a short story called The Ocean for a book edited by Tom Keneally and Rosie Scott, um, which was to raise money for the refugee cause and uh, and I tried, I think, in that, in that small text to talk about the drowned and the saved and how this is both a kind of 
a necessary rapprochement with these images, but also um, unavoidably political. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And thank you again for inviting me. This is a very exciting topic for me. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. That was very rich and evocative and resonant. Um, thank you very much. Jill. Okay, thank you. Um, and first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that um, I'm speaking to everyone from um, Ghana land and uh, I acknowledge them as the custodians of this place where I live and work and um, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Uh, I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, I'm perhaps along the lines of what um, Gail said, I think perhaps I should start, I wasn't going to, but I think I might as well, is to um, state the obvious, as most people would know, I um, was born and brought up in Sydney, which is on the um, Pacific. And for a large part of my teenage years, at least, I lived um, in Sydney's northern beach suburbs. And now, of course, I live in Adelaide. And although where I live now is certainly not um, on the sea, um, I'm very aware of um, what I left, that is um, the, the sense that I had of the Pacific and particularly the Sydney sense of the Pacific and what I see now um, when I say go to, um, well, we, we often go to West Beach, people may know West Beach, it's an interesting place because apart from anything else it's also very close to the airport and I think that leads me into, um, in general, the kinds of things that um, I've been interested in vis-a-vis -vis, um, bodies of water. And recently, but not just recently, um, more broadly weather and thinking of um, both um, water in its oceanic or um, riverine or, um, I guess the senses of on the earth or um, the oceanic sense, but also the water above us, that is through clouds and rain or lack of clouds and rain. Um, and I've done um, a fair amount of writing about that. And it's, I guess in general, um, as a poet, um, I view a lot of my writing as field work. Um, the field, of course, can be text just as much as what I can see and hear and experience. Um, but certainly the poet, amongst other things, as recorder of daily events and environments. And that leads me to think about not just um, the I in the poem or me talking about me, but um, as part of a much broader system of networks um, and certainly extraterrestrial, um, that is looking up and at the stars and um, thinking about that, and also a little bit lower down um, weather systems, as um, you can see through clouds or clear skies, night and day, um, the diurnal, all those sorts of things. Um, and also um, a sense of being both local and global at the same time, and of course, by taking account of the movement of weather, um, whether it's across the ocean, um, whether it's implied through drying up of rivers, um, flooding of rivers, those sorts of things um, is, I guess, part of what um, I've done as a poet, you know, for quite a long time. But I've been also thinking, um, and I'm not quite sure where to take this yet, this is, um, I know um, some other Australian poets have been thinking along these lines, Peter Minter being one of them. But the idea of the archipelagic, um, which Glissant has um, talked about, um, certainly from the um, Caribbean point of view. Um, but um, I'm interested in that and wondering how I can um, think about that a little bit more. But again, it's um, a sort of trans movement um, it's um, thinking about locality rather than borders. 
Um, it's thinking about the um, atopic as well as the topological, um, the latitudinal, um, and also um, what kinds of exchanges take place um, between peoples. Um, and um, yeah, we, we know what's, um, and um, Michelle and um, Gail have already drawn our attention to um, migrations and um, forced and otherwise. Um, but also to think about um, ways of exchange if you're not thinking about borders. Um, and also what are the what are means of exchange between writers and also writers and readers. Um, and, um, you know, uh, what kind of perhaps barter system might be involved in that. As I say, it's from my own point of view, something I'm just starting to think about. Um, and I'm also, I guess, interested in that personal thing, because I mentioned at the start, you know, um, I've stood on the Pacific um, in Sydney and thought about those really high cliffs that um, you get and the huge waves crashing against them and how I, you know, as a child and teenager and adult experienced that. And then when you go to, say, the, um, the long um, sequence of beaches in Adelaide, it's not dissimilar in parts of Melbourne as well. Um, we see a different kind of oceanic movement, and indeed Adelaide's on a gulf. Sydney's um, right um, on the or Tasman Sea, hence, and then the Pacific. So there's a different way of thinking about it, and I'm wondering um, a little bit more about um, standing on the beach rather than on a cliff, for instance, and what that means. And also, um, I certainly notice in Adelaide on Adelaide beaches, and even I was recently down a bit further south in the southeast, there's an enormous amount of rack comes on the beaches. Now, I haven't been on a Sydney beach, I must admit, for more than, more than a decade, so maybe that's the case in Sydney as well. But I was never as conscious of it. Uh, you know, there was seaweed that would come in, but the enormous amount of rack that comes in um, and you know how the, there's almost rack farming. Um, it looks like we were watching on a beach just a little while ago. I think it, I can't remember where it was, but it was somewhere down the southeast. Um, and then thinking about what kinds of compositional procedures might be involved in um, the sorts of writing about flow and network and of blending together both the local and personal um, experiential and also observational field work with um, what's going on out there. So certainly in my work, um, I've combined um, archival um, research uh, and um, other forms of research, a bit of scientific um, research, if you want to put it like that, um, to sort of blend in the, that sort of material, um, what's going on out in the world beyond uh, the particular latitude that I'm on. Um, what's going on with the soil and earth that um, is washing into rivers. And um, one of the poems I read last night was very clear about that. Um, and what um, goes into the water, what we've put into the water, but also to think about what comes back. And again, we get back to the wave. Um, so I'm interested in confluence of both um, global and local um, and also how that aligns with the personal and the effective at, at ground level tidal, um, that liminal level between um, um, being on the beach and being in the water. Um, and, you know, looking at developing various new compositional strategies, um, which I can talk more about if you want to ask me. I think I'll stop there if that's enough from me. Thank you, Jill. I, there's some emerging resonances here, which is exciting. Now for my out of alphabetical order, um, Matt Hooten, would you like to, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Mandy. It's uh, all those O's in my last name are distracting, I understand. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm so excited and, and pleased to be speaking with you and, and listening to you all. I feel very lucky today. I grew up in a wilderness commune on Vancouver Island, 
so there was never any escaping bodies of water, even if they were in northern bodies. The Pacific on all sides, rivers, lakes, glaciers, and beyond that, salmon spawning grounds, early frosts and icicles that hung from our eaves, our back hoe and hand dug well, rain 200 days a year, lichen and moss over every outdoor surface, lawn, rock, tree, and house, mycelium networks the size of cities moiling through the wet earth. The summer I was 10 years old, I watched a family friend pull an Olympia oyster off the rocks at Couch and Bay, shuck it with a Swiss army knife and tip the mucus-like creature down his throat. I was revolted and impressed. And two years later, my little brother and I were baptized in that same man's hot tub, our whole congregation in the backyard, the water lukewarm. I refused to close my eyes and still recall the wavering, blurred face of our pastor from beneath the surface the moment of pause that caused my heart to twist and flash in fear, and then the incongruously militant hymns while I dried off with a giant fluorescent blue sex wax beach towel and stood dripping in my bathing shorts while my brother was also reborn. A decade later, that same pastor, a guest at my wedding, took my arm during the oceanfront reception and told me he'd just been to visit our mutual acquaintance in prison, a young man, the son of the oyster shucker and hot tub baptism tank owner, who had, in rage over money and stolen narcotics, cracked open the head of one of my schoolmates with a claw hammer. When I sat down to write this, I planned to frame a series of vignettes, eco-happy memories of growing up in a temperate rainforest, to talk about cedars in a downpour, how it's possible to sit beneath their dense drooping branches without feeling so much as a drop, or about learning to swim at three years of age in Shawnigan Lake, where the teacher held my head underwater to cure me of my discomfort and fear, of how this tiny trauma inspired me to become a lifeguard and swimming instructor, or if pressed for something resembling narrative, about my partner and I caught in a typhoon off the east coast of Borneo, our tiny diesel boat chugging through swells that dwarfed us, terrified until two mating sea turtles rose from the frothing turquoise to quiet our panic. I could have written about children daring one another to sneak up and pluck my chest hair in Korean bathhouses, or listening to the women divers of Jeju Island whistling to expel the stale air from their lungs as they surfaced with sacks of abalone and sea urchin. But, in honesty, I can't stop thinking about my classmate, his skull opened in a brutal round hole, fluids leaking from it as from a cracked shell. And I'm thinking about prison, I'm wondering what the drinking water tastes like, if the showers are warm or cool, if my criminal acquaintance dreams of his father on the shore of Cowichan Bay with his knife and collection of dripping white oysters. I've never written about any of this before, and yet it's present, all of it, always. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Okay, thanks for that image. We'll, um... <laughs> <laughs> Nick. Um, thanks, Mandy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Well done. Um, <laughs> um, oh, I too, okay. I too am speaking from Ghana land and thank uh, the Ghana people whose land this is. Ghana country is where the Adelaide Plains meet the sea, crisscrossed by little creeks that run from the hills across those plains into the sea. Last night, um, I read a piece that was really about coastlines, uh, coastlines being places where the sea meets the land and the salt water crosses with the fresh water. Um, I read a piece about crossings. When I got the question from Meg and Mandy about what these flows of water um, do in my writing, I hadn't thought about it before, but when I did think about it, um, I was, fascinated by what I found. Um, what I found is that these movements of water in my work are utterly bound up 
with changing perceptions of time or changing conceptions of time. Um, as Gail said a minute ago, time as water. Um, and I, uh, I share that interest, but it's also changing water, um, giving a sense of changing time. So I just want to go back to a couple of my novels. One I wrote long ago called Paper Nautilus, which is about the shell, the paper Nautilus, which is found on southern beaches in Australia. Um, in, in my novel, I draw on a local um, idea that these paper Nautilus come in every seven years on the tide. And so that idea of the cycle of time, the seven years, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's what people say, and it brings a fairy tale or a mythic sense of time into a narrative. And in fact, in that book, the whole narrative is then structured around a cycle cyclical or spiraling sense of time that scrolls backwards. Um, later on um, in my novel, The Custodians, which features a fictional version of Lake Mungo. I think you can see some of the slides. I'm looking at the cover of Paper Nautilus where you see the, um, the, the shells coming in. Um, there's another slide of Lake Mungo um, re relates to my novel, The Custodians. Now there, the sense of time is radically altered by the fact that this is a dry lake. It's been dry since the last ice age 10,000 years ago, but before that, there was water there. So looking at that aridity gives a sense of long time a changed sense of scale um, into our thinking about this place. And related to that, of course, is the fact that Mungo woman and Mungo man emerged from the erosion of that aridity um, in the 1970s to radically change our sense of time in this continent. Um, at that time in the 1970s, um, Aboriginal presence in this country was thought to be maybe 4,000 years or so, like a biblical sense of time. Um, Mungo woman and Mungo man pushed that back to 40,000 years. Um, if we need numbers to equate with time immemorial, it pushed our time scale of this country back into time immemorial. And that changing scale is related to water, its movement, its presence, its absence. Um, the first of these slides shows a painting that is well known, this one, uh, it's called the Malayan Prow, a very important painting in Australia done um, in Arnhem Land by Yulnu artist Mimimi Mimarika. Um, of the Macassan prows that used to come seasonally um, from the Indonesian archipelago to Northern Australia. Now, that painting was made in 1948, but it refers to a pattern of movement that was centuries old then. So it conflates two different time frames at a time after the Pacific War when there was a new wave um, of, of outsiders moving in, white people moving in to that Arnhem Land region. But this movement is also one of exchange and generation. Um, and if we can see the painting with the, the moon um, and the evening star at the top, this is a recent painting by Boathe, another Yungle artist from Arnhem Land, which the lines that are running down it vertically are the flow of water when the salt water and the fresh water interchange and related to the cycle of the moon, new life is generated in the form of those creatures that are 
moving up the painting. Um, this is again an ancient Jungle song, um, the song of the moon bone, it's sometimes called, um, which was translated into English, adapted into English by anthropologists in the 1940s. Um, but this is a contemporary version of it made on country without reference at all to that translation, um, but telling the same timeless story. Um, and finally, and it's taking up again the idea of archipelago that Jill's been talking about. Um, these crossings are to do with the waters of Northern Australia crossing over into East Timor as well. And I just think it's interesting that the cover image of this book showing those young figures standing on the boat um, echo the Malayan prow image with the figures that are standing on that boat crossing the water. And these sorts of ideas of, of crossing and repeat pattern um, are very interesting to me and keep expanding and keep changing and becoming more mobile um, as a pressure on my writing or an enabling presence in my writing, both to do with narrative and you know, flows of words on the page. So I think uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. I love that idea of ebb and flow occurring across millennia on the continent. Um, Kim Kruger. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, respect for Wurundjeri elders and ancestors on um, whose land I live. Um, which has sustained me all my life and from where I am joining you today. Just bear with me a second. Thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this panel. I'm in no way uh, near a, an established or emerging writer. I'm only just starting to write essays and stories in the past few years. So in terms of considering how water floods or ebbs into my writing, I think it's too soon to tell. Um, but I do think about water a lot though. And water is integral to my being. I think my family have always considered me a watery person and that's not a weak thing. Um, I've had an affinity with um, water from an early age. Again, my family, they reminiscent often about how I'd run into the sea as soon as our car stopped anywhere on the coast. And I think water shapes my imaginary as the sea looms large. I identify as um, Marina and South Sea Islander. So I have water in the naming of my identity. I've always considered myself a saltwater woman. I love sea fish more than fresh water. I could swim in the water all day if I didn't get burnt. But I grew up on Wurundjeri country and that's the country that I grew up on. That's behind my dad's house um, in the mountain forests, which are quite cool and wet most of the year. And I continue to live on Wurundjeri country today where I live near the Merry Merry Creek. And the water I drink is Wurundjeri water. So when I look at the title of this panel, I'm immediately returned to my childhood self, relishing the January floods in far North Queensland, which dangled the opportunity for the roads to be cut, meaning we couldn't return south and meant that we had the chance to spend just a little bit more time with my Nana. I don't think water on its own shapes the themes of my work. I think it all, it's always present in amongst all the other elements that make up my world. It's there in relationship to land, stars, people, plants, everything. Um, it was asked, how does water or its absence inform um, my idea of Australia? And I guess I get quite literal here. 
where Australia to me is an irrelevant and illegal construct. So when I think about water in relation to this, to the concept of Australia, I think water informs my idea of Australia through its control, how water is monetized and how the rivers are poured into the pockets of corporations, resulting in mass fish kills and towns left without drinking water, or how the water table is ignored and polluted in the pursuit of resource extraction, despite Aboriginal communities sharing the knowledge of how the water is connected. Um, if we're talking about the continent made up of 500 Aboriginal countries, then I think of water in its role in the weather and the interconnectedness of it all, how the waterways connect neighbours, weather systems, song lines. My mum calls Earth planet water because most of its surface is, is covered in water. And it makes me think of the billionaire space race and how they're desperately trying to get off this planet to be the first to exploit another. I'm not sure why they are upheld as heroes when in doing so, they destroy the very thing that makes this planet habitable. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. And I, I just want to explain the images are from Wurundjeri country, some where I grew up, some where I live now, and some from the Kalangi State Forest, which is um, part of the Melbourne water catchment area, which is being logged by the state as we speak. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yes, <laughs> lots, of, lots of very depressing things going on, isn't there, in relation to water? But I also appreciate your comment that water is integral to my being, as it is for all of us. Rachel Mead, I throw to you. Oh, thanks very much, Mandy. Um, it's a it's an honour to be here and to, invited. Um, yeah among all of these incredible writers and thinkers. So, um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm sitting here on para unceded Paramount country, and I'd like to pay my respects to uh, the Paramount people and their elders, uh, past, present, and those still to come. Uh, so uh, when um, I've got the question about how does water um, flood into or ebb out of my writing, um, it was, I was really uh, taken by surprise going back through um, yeah, past uh, poetry collections as how much water there was um, there and how much um, aridity and lack of water also um, yeah, was, um, uh, was present in the work. Um, I found that it's, it seems to, uh, water seems to ebb in and flow out of um, my work pretty unconsciously. Um, even when I'm attempting to do something uh, like a, what I can, a memoir poem, which has, doesn't have water anywhere in, uh, in it in terms of uh, the idea that sparked it. Um, by the time I finish the draft, I find it has the ocean or clouds and rain or yeah, even a swimming pool <laughs> leaking into it. Um, so when, um, when I began writing poetry and especially the collection that I, um, that I wrote for my PhD, um, I used water as an, in, as an intrinsic element of um, rendering um, a sense of place and an ecological understanding of place based on um, observation of the natural world. But um, as um, I kept writing, um, I found that uh, more and more I've come to use water and, um, and weather um, alongside uh, the biological and geological aspects of ecology uh, to do much more sort of emotional work um, in my poems. So um, I know that sounds very much using uh, water and weather as a metaphor for human states of mind <laughs> sounds incredibly cliched, but I hope that, um, yeah, the finished product is actually something a little more interesting and original than that, um, that idea sounds. Um, so in, um, in my first collection, The Sixth Creek, water played a dual role in that. Um, so in addition to being um, obviously a fundamental element of local ecology, um, uh, and therefore very uh, like an essential element to rendering um, my home habitat in, um, 
in, uh, in text. Um, I also used water as a means of uh, thematic framing uh, for the entire collection. The, um, the poems um, had a bioregional focus. So I used the boundaries formed by the catchment area of my local creek system as a way of thematically restricting uh, my work. So, um, and my catchment area is the sixth creek of the River Torrens system in the Mount Lofty Ranges in South Australia. So, um, and then when I moved on um, and kept writing uh, uh, eco-poetically focused work, um, I ranged a bit further afield, but uh, looking back on it now, I, it's interesting how um, water was once again a central concern. I found myself writing about landscapes that were formed by water, either as a solid, so ice in Antarctica, the freshwater systems of the Murray and Glenelg rivers and the Whanganui River in Aotearoa, or um, also the, um, our great oceans as the, um, the Southern Ocean and also uh, the Pacific Ocean when I was writing about Rarotonga. So, so but um, the interesting thing is, well, uh, I say it's, it's only probably interesting to me. Um, these are landscapes to whom uh, I was a stranger. So I really only had a very shallow understanding of their local ecology. So the work that I was, uh, that, I was that was being generated by these landscapes, um, I was very conscious that it was coming from only observing their ecology at a singular point in time rather than the many years and seasons um, of uh, the earlier work. Um, the, so uh, an example of this was um, the cycle that I wrote about Tanda, the Lake Air um, Basin, um, which I was really lucky to be able to observe um, at, at, at a time of flood, so when it was undergoing um, transformation. Um, but, um, and so the work, that particular poem sequence, I used another poetic framing device to sort of imply the long-term cyclical nature of the presence of water after a long dry and the way this landscape is very much attuned to those sort of macro cycles. And, um, and I've also been lucky enough to observe that landscape in its, um, or in both, in both dry and flood. Um, so I really wanted to puncture, uh, I remember at, in, on both occasions visiting that landscape, um, uh, I was, uh, cons people were constantly um, commenting to me, oh, this is, it's empty, um, there's nothing out there. And I really wanted to punk, I mean, I'm sure that the Arabana people <laughs> would have something, uh, a very different view of, um, of that landscape, anything but empty. So I really wanted to, to that understanding or that um, that um, sort of that mindset about um, the remote areas in um, in Australia and show how you know absence can actually be its own kind of presence as well. So um, then uh, later in that collection, the floor and the pattern, I did also did another sequence um, based in Rarotonga in the Pacific. And it's been really interesting um, being in, um, coaxed to look back on that work. And now I can see in hindsight that that was a, um, an, I used, an, that was an initial foray into using water and meteorological observation as a metaphor for um, a human emotional landscape rather than purely ecological observation, which is how water had appeared in earlier poems. So um, uh, in the work that I've just finished, um, uh, I've been playing that saying uh, that climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. Um, and then, so, um, and I've been playing with that um, from an ecological observation standpoint, but then also uh, like using the parallels with, um, uh, with uh, the, a more human emotional landscape. So when I'm uh, writing about individual humans from the understanding of us being part of nature and not separate to it or superior, um, I'm using that um, the parallel that um, it's personality or character uh, with humans is what you expect, but it's um, sort of dialogue and gesture and behavior is what you get. <laughs> so um, yeah, in that way, um, I'm sort of using water and weather to carry 
uh, the, a bit more of an emotional load in the poem with weather as a subtext for an emotional state of mind. So yeah, I think, I think I should stop there. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rachel. Um, once again, some lots of strong resonances with what other people have said. Jennifer. Hi, um, I'm also on Ganayara. Um, thanks for having me at this panel and the symposium. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, dyschronia mostly. Um, it sits pretty nicely amongst what everyone else has been speaking of, I think. But uh, one of the first and the last things to happen in that book is that the sea withdraws. So um, I'm sort of here representing the ebb. Uh, the sea abandons the town. And I started with this image, um, which I had in my head of that sort of long, um, low tide and what it might reveal. Uh, and it sounds kind of apocalyptic unless you're familiar with the Upper Spencer Gulf. And if you've ever sat at Port Germain at low tide and seen how that flat expanse stretches out under the jetty, it actually is quite a familiar image. Um, but there was something in it for me in the way it took that sort of familiar climate crisis visual of sea level rise and flipped it so that it could be um, at once familiar and shocking. Um, there's this idea in a lot of Australian, a lot of a settler colonial trope in a lot of Australian fiction of the landscape as a threat. And um, I was very conscious I wanted to depict the, the ocean's agency in a way that wasn't simply hostile, um, that showed its power to change us and um, the way that it could refuse to be a repository for our waste and heat and death. Um, and to do that without gearing too strongly into sort of magical realism or science fictional uh, modes, because I feel like that can sometimes free the reader from responsibility. And I wanted the reader to feel very complicit in what was happening in the book um, and not be able to say, oh, it's just fiction, it's just a fairy tale. So I had to stay in that sort of liminal place, believable place, sort of our world, but a bit tilted. Um, so a bit about the temporality. Uh, the climate crisis for me is, it's an everything problem, but it's also a problem of time in a lot of important ways. Um, it combines urgency and this huge geological scale. Um, it removes or shortens a promised future um, and raises questions about intergenerational responsibility. Um, and in some ways, it's a result of living in this hyper-capitalist moment where we forget the past and forget about consequences and just live in this now, now, now. Um, so dyschronia then is kind of a diagnosis of time sickness, but it was also a method, a way of looking at the world and a way of writing a book. Um, I wanted to try and shift people's perception of time, both in scale and in linearity and to look more circularly um, or to fall into deep time in all directions. Um, and so that became then the formal logic of the book, um, much the same way that I suppose the Nautilus became the formal logic in Nick's book. Um, Clarice Lispector called the sea the most incomprehensible of non-human existences. Uh, and in trying to break the reader's habits of mind and honestly my own habits of mind. Um, I tried to bring in the non-human through um, this kind of cuttlefish consciousness that swims through the book and also to bring in this kind of other other mind by giving my main character Sam uh, is able to see the future so giving her a non-typical mind I was able to look at all these different kind of interpretations of her otherness um, was she a mystical visionary or a sick person or a social problem or an opportunity for capitalism? Um, so this single image of the sea led me to the characters and the structure and the themes of the book. And that's, that's usually the way that I work. I start with something that comes from a dream. Um, but the book sort of became about various kinds of abandonment of responsibility. Um, parents abandoning 
children, the sea abandoning the town, the companies that were responsible for cleaning up, abandoning the landscape, um, very familiar in this country. Um, and I found I was writing a lot about failure, failures of accountability and of care um, and of structures that we think of as permanent. Um, and it was interesting to hear what Gail said about grief as well and the sea as this kind of image of grief because that really resonates with me as well. Um, I was recently a guest in one of James Bradley's classes and he asked me why there was so much shoreline in my work. Um, and honestly, I had not noticed at all. Um, but then I look at it and the literal is in absolutely everything. Um, and I think it has something to do with moving between worlds for me, like water is the unconscious mind, the dream state, maybe an escape, um, and maybe that emotional realm as well. Um, so there is a bit of the sea in the airways as well in the new book. Um, there's some images of swimming, walking into the sea, uh, disappearing, a lot of sort of being relieved of the weight of the body while immersed in water. Um, and that notion of like the border between you and me, the border between you and a bird, between the land and the sea being very porous, um, zones of transition rather than dividing lines. Um, and that related to sort of ideas of gender and consent and embodiment and foreignness that all the ideas that I circle in that book. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, but hopefully that gives you an idea. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, yes, we'll see if we can continue the conversation about dyschronia. Very interesting. Uh, Lucy, finally to people whose names begin with the Cornish TRE. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> um, yeah, early colonials. Yeah. I wouldn't say they were nation builders like um, Alexander Downer. They definitely destroyed their way through. Um, I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the Kaurna people whose land I'm on right now. I've come across to South Australia, uh, the Naranjeri where Salt Creek is set, and the Wurundjeri people of Melbourne, which is where I mostly write. Their lands were never ceded. Um, water, I was so interested when this came up. I just thought water, I guess there's a bit of water in my work, but um. I started thinking about it and I have not written a single thing that is not centred around water that um, doesn't have water at its heart. Um, I asked a friend who's a psychologist what it meant once and she just said, oh, Lucy, water is always emotion. Um, so any an image or a landscape um, that I visit is always the beginning of a piece of writing to me. And what follows from that is a, a narrative or a character usually, and then the story appears quite quickly. So this is um, an image from the first time I visited the Coorong, which is only about 10 years ago, I guess, and it was at the end of a very long drought. And um, this place has always had this very kind of almost mythical quality in family folklore. My distant great-grandmother, many greats, um, died being rowed across the Coorong in a difficult childbirth and um, part of Salt Creek is about that. So I just stood there looking at that and, um, and was instantly uh, aware of why this place has always had a kind of haunting effect in, in my family's life. Um, so this is a kind of classic place for me to start. Um, to start writing and in fact I had a little index card in my pocket and I started writing immediately just about my impressions of this place but I wasn't too aware of the amount of damage that I was seeing only of this incredible sort of resonance that the landscape had. Um, and another the next book I wrote uh, is Wolf Island and and that was um, uh, the catalyst for that was just seeing an image of an eye of a house on a on a sea um, this is the second or third image I think I've got, I've got available. Um, and it just shows this huge house that is taking up the entire space of an island. And um, sometimes these images for me are like a line that is flung out from my unconscious that kind of hooks me and drags me in and becomes that thing that I'm going to write about. 
And it's not always water. Um, recently, it has also been the absence of water. Um, so in a new image, I don't actually know, am I supposed to be moving these images? I really don't know how to do this, sorry. Um, is a picture of a railway station in the mid north, an abandoned railway station um, that uh, to me looks like the death of colonialism. So both Salt Creek and Wolf Island are, are um, yeah, I'll come to that image in a minute, are set in liminal estuarine landscapes that are marked by seasonal flows of water ebbing between salt and fresh and by marshland as well. But the liminality of water applies to character, the characters of the books and their transition states too. I think we live in a flow relationship with landscape, whatever that might be. We shape each other, landscape and people however much we try to disregard that. And we see a huge amount of that in uh, the political world, which I'll come to. Um, the, colonial land, the colonial relationship is of extraction of value, of exploitation, whereas the traditional uh, Aboriginal relationship with it is of a kind of great connection and of an interweaving of life and landscape. Um, but still, I believe that water, watery landscapes shape characters and they also therefore shape plot. And likewise, people shape water. So it is this kind of ebbing and flowing that happens with a relationship, I think. Water operates uh, metaphorically. There is the George French Angus image, the uh, lithograph that was just up a minute ago, the fifth image. Um, the image for me, uh, it was done in 1842, so about 10 years or so before uh, the characters of Salt Creek arrived in the Burong. Um, and that image is, it's documentary, um, it's polemical and it's personal as well. He's selling South Australia in it uh, to British migrants as a place that can potentially be exploited. But his diaries make clear, as does the image, his image, that he was incredibly emotionally moved by this landscape as well. You know, he uses quite hyperbolic language, stupendous, things like that. And there is a very housing quality to a lot of his um, lithographs. The Coorong, as he sees it, is a kind of Eden, very different from this drought-stricken landscape that we see here. Um, to visit now is to look at the space between the past and the present and to wonder. So I just see this huge kind of uh, space filled with an enormous amount of damage. It's like a great big uh, psychological wound in that landscape. Um, and and how that can be healed is part of, uh, I suppose, what we're all sort of looking at politically at the moment. Landscape is political. Water is political. Um, so this is the world that the Finch family arrive in, and it is a beautiful watery world when they first get there. Uh, and they steal the land and instantly start despoiling it. Um, the lagoon the lagoon, which is this kind of long, thin uh, strip of water that runs between huge sand hills onto the beach. Um, and uh, and this, the mainland is what they think of as the civilised world. It is their civilization, um, And a kind of mini Europe, I suppose, which they think they can organise uh, to fit their vision of uh, civilization. But everything that they do runs against the current of the, of the country. Um, in contrast, the, the Naranjeri, uh, it is a complete world for them, but they can use every part of it. It is entirely coherent, sustainable, uh, plentiful, um, and they have their own tidal movements that they live by, uh, moving from the beach, from the lagoon in the summer, uh, to inland uh, during uh, winter because of uh, tidal uh, problems with water. Um, the 
uh, marshlands that develop during winter. Um, so there are these two, two kind of modes of water in, in, um, in Salt Creek and in my writing often, this safe water and then the water that is dangerous. Um, the dangerous water, the Southern Ocean, uh, represents uh, transgression, wildness, uh, lack of civilization, lack of European civilization, that is. Um, and so much of my feeling about, about these places comes from my feeling about this particular place that I am in right now, the place that I'm uh, visiting, which is on the Florida Peninsula. Uh, my, my deepest family stories come from this region. All of my, uh, the things that I would dream about uh, are about this house. It's the place where we as children long to live. We couldn't understand why we didn't live here all the time. In fact, um, the house at Salt Creek was built partly from shipwrecked timber. And it's part of that rack thing you were talking about, Jill. And this house that I'm in now also has the remains of shipwrecks in it, in door frames and things like that. They kind of appear every now and then. And it feels like the sea is kind of emerging in the house and in our stories. Um, and that kind of liminality between past and present, um, between our watery worlds and uh, the world that we inhabit normally, um, is just is so much part of everything. Um, on the reef below this, this is houses on, on a cliff top and on the reef below us, a bit further along the beach, there's a place that we've always called the Shark Pool. And uh, it's a kind of a family tradition, but, I, but to, to, to call it a tradition sort of diminishes it. It's a, almost like religion to me, I think. Look, every, every summer, every time we're here, we walk along the beach and we go and stand at the shark pool, which is where a grey nurse shark was um, stranded one year when my mother was a child and um, uh, was killed by fishermen eventually and eaten. But we go and pay our respects to the shark, the lost doomed shark in the shark pool. And, um, and so there is a kind of religious quality to this landscape for me, to this wateriness. And all along the beach, there are these uh, amazing uh, dried up riverbeds that would occasionally, they'll occasionally flow when there's, when there's storm damage. Um, and we walk along the beach and, the, and we say the names of these places, first waterfall, second waterfall, and we count them out like incantations, um, this extremely watery place. But water is a, as a kind of terrifying place as well and uh, for me. Um, and sometimes I write that terror in what, what water can mean, not only in terms of transgression with social norms, but with uh, it being actually literally dangerous. So I write about drowning sometimes as well. Um, and, find it fairly terrifying even to write that. But I mean, one of the reasons I think that I return to water is, is that water is at the very centre of what it is to live in Australia. How do we, how do we, how do we deal with it? But I don't mean deal in a kind of control way, although it is a controlling thing for some people. But I, I think it is important to tell the truth about landscape and what it means. Um, Increasingly, I look at the agency of landscape and how it acts and reacts to human interventions. Um, we seem to be sort of stuck at the moment, like our poor dried up rivers. Um, all of the work to shape landscape um, to suit European needs has ended with huge damage to landscape. And if you're writing about one of these watery worlds, I think you're inevitably writing about the political realm as well, even if you don't mention politics. Politics is at the heart of what you're talking about. It's about personal greed, denial of the truth of this country. Um, 
and representing that truth. So when I when I write when I wrote Salt Creek, um, and was looking at Mr. Finch, who's the family patriarch, exploiting ancient water resources, despoiling them, locking them up, controlling them, making them unavailable to the Naranjeri. I feel as if I'm looking not only at the colonial era of Australia, but of the ongoing colonisation. And I see in him Barnaby Joyce and Angus Taylor doing exactly the same things now. And uh, this great fight that's happening between so many Australians who feel a great tenderness for the water that they're attached to, deeply emotionally attached to, and this drive to control and coerce water. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably the direction that more my writing's heading in more looking at that kind of the shift between the individuals who love it and the people who want to exploit it. Um, yeah, and the failure at the local historical level that we see playing out in an ongoing way. That's about it. Thank you very much, Lucy. <coughs> um, one of the things that's coming through is, is some of these South Australian connections, which even when people aren't necessarily from South Australia, there's, there's an evocation of landscape and the way water interacts. That's very rich. Now, we've taken a fair bit of our time. I would, um, I hope you can stay with us we'll, as we have some questions. So I'm going to invite some of my uh, fellow leaders of this panel to ask some specific questions and we'll see if we can get through everybody once. And if we've still got any energy or time, maybe we can have a bit more of a discussion. So I might throw to Madeline now, who has a question for Michelle. Thanks, Madeline. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks very much, Mandy, um, and to all of our readers and speakers today. This has been tremendously um, exciting and invigorating. Um, I am, like many others, am joining today's conversation from unceded Ghana land um, in South Australia. Um, Michelle, I mean, firstly, thank you so much for that beautiful reading last night, um, your comments today, and for the immense privilege um, of sharing Daisy and Wolf with us. Um, I absolutely loved, um, loved reading your novel. Um, and it, reading it, I was thinking about something that um, has occurred to me quite often in looking at Virginia Woolf's work, which is this fact that the British Empire, British colonialism, the stories of people of colour, um, colonised peoples in these places is this kind of hidden, barely hidden below the surface of so much of Wolfe's writing. Um, and this particular quote from Mrs. Dalloway kind of jumped out at me in thinking about that. Um, so in this, I'm just going to, um, if you don't mind, read this quote uh, from Wolfe. So Richard Dalloway is musing, um, there are tides in the body, um, morning meets afternoon, born like a frail shallop on deep, deep floods, Lady Bruton's great grandfather and his memoirs and his campaigns in North America are whelmed and sunk. Um, and obviously oceans and ocean voyages are so important in your work. So I was wondering if you might comment on the kind of natural forces, poetics and histories of the ocean and how you use them to resurface these, the story of Daisy um, as a woman of colour um, from Wolf's um, depiction in your, your novel. We seem to have got a bit frozen here. Michelle, Michelle, are you able to unmute and respond or have you, we lost you? Sorry, I don't know what happened there. No, okay, it's Zoom after all. Please continue. So it was about history and 
So history and um, what were the other things you mentioned, Teresa, this Daisy's voice? Um, well, I sort of just gestured to a couple of things. So they're like obviously the natural forces of the ocean, but there's particular histories and the poetics um, of the ocean. Uh, so I'd have to say that there was a lot of research. There was a lot of, um, um, there was some archival work, reading diaries and journals that were written during the 1920s um, by travellers who took those journeys to familiarise myself with the kinds of um, issues and, and problems and difficulties that Daisy would have experienced as well as reading about the climate in India um, at the time, like um, Gandhi, the, the Gandhian movement and the independence movement, but also um, other, other um, independence activists who were working throughout the empire and in the USA and just the, the circuits of, of political movements that were happening and the way that the oceans were controlled also mm. by different colonial um, powers, the Italians and the British and the fight for that Suez area and Africa and Ethiopia and so forth. So all of those things were so fascinating in the way that, that, that I was like uncovering and learning more about those things and how I could bring them into the narrative and um, a recapturing of time, I think, um, how I could um make uh that 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 moment those those experiences daisy's interior um her her streams of consciousness yes. what is stream of consciousness and why is it um white appropriated you know what why is it a thing that it, it has been appropriated and determined for for by white people for white people and why as a brown person, as a person of colour, do I, um, is the responsibility upon our shoulders to, to uh, um, reposition the political um, uh, relationships between nations and power and economics and, you know, the, the things that, it, that exploit human bodies, brown bodies and... Um, um, yeah, the, the kinds of, I think, um, so those, they were all sort of things that were sort of coming into it. And um, I think the diarization, like moving, shifting from the contemporary narrator to the 1920s, moving back and forth and seeing that there were sort of synchronicities in terms of current contemporary politics and what was happening in the 1920s and what was happening through the century before that in India and in, in, in colonies of the British Empire um, that, that impacted on Eurasian people. Mm. Um, so um, all of those things, I think, yeah, the diarization, of the novel, um, I think uh, is something that, that I, I think made the present tense um, and the, the, the the point of view of Daisy's voice um, I can kind of enable that. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like seeing fiction as these kinds of threads where there's there's threads of history, there's there's threads of lived experience, um, and there's threads of archive and um, and and these things are, are kind of. Uh, are rearranged in a way in fiction and and can be done so as a way of decolonizing mm -hmm. what literature has done. Um, I'm interested in what what literature has done to colonize people, and I think we that's something that um, I could use my voice to address through and 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 bring Daisy's voice to life. And her interior world, and her the problems that face her, and and um, how is it for a brown woman? How does it impact on her family, on her, on her body, on the body of her children? You know, make that real. Make, yeah. make 
enable white people to actually understand what it's like to have your narrative written over by, by white narratives telling you what is temporality, temporality, what is stream of consciousness, and to find that Daisy's voice is buried in that. One of the most interesting things about it was that there's a 30-page um, research paper on the Indian aspects of Mrs. Dalloway, um, mm. which is called Clarissa and the Cooley's Wives, and it's quite well known. Um, and in that paper, Daisy's actually described as the English woman. So that was really interesting because it pointed, it was disappointing, of course, to read that. But it, it also was a bit overwhelming to consider the extent to which, and I'd like to put this to you all as researchers and colleagues that I've worked with, you know, over the time, the extent to which research is disinvested in minority um, stories and um, to the point that it will obfuscate and um, uh, overlook important archival and yeah, import, important things within stories that avoid researching it. That, that was the only reason I could work out why a researcher hasn't hasn't picked this up, and especially one who's, who's written about India in Mrs. Dalloway. Yeah, absolutely. There's no investment in it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Um, this is going to seem a bit clinical, but I'm going to go through each writer just to start with. So, Theo, I'm wondering if you can uh, have a question for Gail. Hi. Yeah, I'd love that. Um, oh, I hope my question also uh, registers some of the flows between northern and southern waters that, um, and the threads that you were just speaking about, Michelle. Um, I most recently, hi, Gail, I most recently read um, Our Shadows. Uh, and it was just a, a haunting story about our intertwined histories. Um, so I'll ask a question about that. Um, for Nell and Frances, the twin sisters at the, at the center of the story, the ocean holds such sway in their imaginations um, as they grow up in the gruff country um, of the Western Australian gold mining towns. Um, I'm really interested in how our imaginations, uh, which are nurtured and um, enabled by art, how um, through that we're able to carry the splendor of the ocean hundreds of kilometers in inland. Um, and I'd like to know more about why it was Hokusai's The Great Wave that made it onto the girls' um, childhood bedroom wall. And uh, what's the significance of this particular piece in this uh, arid, otherwise arid setting? Oh, thanks, Thea. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I guess one of the things I didn't say um, when I introduced a kind of biographical element earlier is that after living in the Kimberleys, we moved to the central desert um, as a family, which is where my family were from. My father was a, a miner. Um, he went into the mines at 14. His father was a miner. My, my family has a connection with that area of the Eastern gold fields and on the edge of the Great Sandy Desert. So it is both aridity and plenitude, as it were, that, that preoccupy me. And, and I've just, I've loved hearing the other writers speak here and to see the ways in which um, those things that preoccupy us link us as well to place. Um, even thinking about, I was suddenly reminded, and this seems irrelevant, but I hope it's not, suddenly reminded that there's a Philip Larkin poem called Water, um, which begins, if I were called in to construct a religion, I should make use of water. And it's, it's a conservative poem in as much as he still imagines a religion that is, this is Matt's what Matt said, what um, uh, Lucy said. I mean, there are, sort of, I'll gather my thoughts. This idea that there is a um, metaphysic to, to water itself, not just the ocean, the presence of the ocean, but, but uh, and it was um, 
Kim too, who talked about being in a sense composed of water. And I suppose I'm very interested in what Nick called the scalar, the idea that these um, intuitions of substance and affect move through all these different scales in the space of one text. And that that's one of the things that we do. Uh, when ch children are interested in the hyperbolic, I think, children are interested in the big image and the, the enticement of something outlandish or strange. And the Hokusai Great Wave, which did turn up in a um, little shop in Kalgoorlie when I was a child, uh, you know, was such a, such a displaced uh, image. I was longing, I guess, nostalgically for the water of the Kimberleys where I'd grown up. And I, this links to me with elegy, the, the way in which uh, life's taken by waves and um, grief as a kind of submersion or capsizing or loss of self, that going down of drowning, which is a muffling and a loss of bodily boundary that could be read, you know, in that, um, uh, and again, I'm thinking poetically, partly because and because of things that Jill said about rack, about these bits and pieces out of which we construct a text. I was thinking of that um, section in Walt Whitman's Out of a Cradle Gently Rocking, where he says that, that he listens to the ocean and it lisps, that's his word, it lisps to me, um, the, the low and delicious word death, and again, death, death death and death. He's got five deaths in two yeah. lines. And that idea that that um, these that we've we have this this um, uh, whole aesthetic traditions to do with um, and I'm all of my books linked so I do have Japan somewhere it's from Broome and seeing Japanese pearl divers. Um, but the link between um, the representation, which is deeply aestheticized, the oddity of its misplacement, the idea of an inland sea. So, um, you know, as a child, I went up to, you know, the area near Fitzroy Crossing, where you can see, you know, famously, there's the Fossil Down Station and Gogo Station uh, that are from the Devonian period, which is 430 million years old, and you can see Adonites in the rock faces and so on. So that idea of an inland sea, a buried sea, how it links to representation and um, acidity. But but these um, different scales of knowing about ocean right to that um, interiorized ocean of the self, the fact that we are composed of water as well. I suppose that's what I was enlisting there in, in such a prestigious and in some cases um, cliched image. Does that make sense, Theo? I'm sorry, I... That was very impressive. No, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Meg, I'm wondering if um, you have a question for Jill Jones. Okay, uh, Jill, uh, you, you, you said that you might um, be interested in talking a bit more about your new compositional strategies that you are developing. And I was you know, interested last night when you spoke about that um, two syllable lines to write the cracked earth, to, to, to write the dry. You spoke about the experiments um, for writing against Adani and, 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 and the threat it poses to the reef. I wonder whether you could talk a bit about some of the experiments you're currently undertaking with writing cloud forms. Oh, um, right. Um, yes. yes. Uh, and sadly, that um, material was going to go online, but it hasn't got there yet. So I can't even direct people to look at it. <laughs> uh, it'll be in text journals soon. Um, yes, I, I was um, trying to, I guess, um, figure out how to get, dare I say it, flow going in the work um, and partly through I guess an associative process um, of um, the very local that is well me as um, the um, obs observing body um, or an eye indeed um, situated um, 
and indeed in, in, in my particular case with um, someone else, a partner. Um, so as that sort of local and effective um, thing juxtaposed with um, literally taking notes on looking up, and I'm still taking notes about clouds and thinking about certainly clouds in um, the Southern Hemisphere because um, there are more clouds here than in the Northern Hemisphere because of the larger oceanic um, space. Um, and also, and, and ways of, of sort of, um, I guess, overlaying and um, interweaving um, uh, the kind of flow with an idea of interruption, um, because there are interruptions to the oceans, obviously due to continents and islands. Um, there are also interruptions due to the fact that um, us humans have put gigantic um, container ships there, et cetera, et cetera. I'm still thinking about um, containerization and the um, problems involved in that, but I haven't come to a poetic solution for that one yet. Um, and also the interruptions that are involved in, um, I guess, terrestrial water systems, um, which is, as you say, the dry, um, but also um, the way that human intervention has changed flow um, and, and we see that all around the world to what we've done here in Australia um, and the huge dam systems in various places like China and the United States. And we, we know all these systems that um, have been put in place. Um, so it's trying to deal with, um, I guess, those sorts of things. And the other thing, um, <clears throat> and it was something someone mentioned last night and also I think this permeated through some of what people have talked about today is the idea of the presence and absence of water um, and the presence and absence um, that has been brought about, well, the absence that's been brought about by human intervention into um, environments. Um, and I've often experimented with um, dropping vowels, hence the Adani thing, it was a slightly different, um, I guess, political approach, but to drop vowels or um, to insert space um, into the poems themselves, both as read and breathed out, um, but also on the page as um, a spatial organisation to do that as well. But certainly to get levels of scale between the personal, the observational, and I guess the reporting and all the archival or documentation of what's going on, etc. Does that answer that question? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Matt. I have a question for you. Um, despite the fact that you weren't, you said you might have written about Vancouver Island and its various. Um, wetnesses as it came through, you, you did actually convey it quite well. Um, and I'm wondering about, you know, you've written about different continents, you've written about Canada, you've written about South Korea, um, you're living in South Australia, and I know you're writing a book set on a river in South America. So I'm wondering um, about how you feel placed or, or unplaced as a writer. Ooh. Ooh. Thanks, Mandy. That's that's a really good question. Um, what am I thinking about? Thinking about home. Um, home for me is 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 a wet realm. Um, you know, I am from a temperate rainforest, and and so um, I think there's some part of me that is always looking for some connection to home, as I see it in my work as as an artist. And I think I do that intuitively, and then. Um, you know, I, I try to sort of create narratives around that so that I can, I can sound like I, I'm not a complete idiot. But, um, but you know, what, what, what is that? What, what is home and, 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 and water and artistic practice? Um, for some reason this week, despite being, um, you, know, you know, sort of inundated in a wonderful way and immersed by, by all this talk of, of water, um, I'm thinking about bodies. I'm thinking about human bodies a lot, um, and and that that sort of came through in, in what I presented earlier. I'm thinking about my grandparents who um, 
ran a mobile x-ray unit in Northern Alberta in the 1940s. Uh, my grandmother was um, wrongly quarantined in a sanatorium and wrongly diagnosed with tuberculosis. So she helped out as a kind of makeshift nurse in the sanatorium, um, didn't catch TB somehow, and then was asked if she would put off her planned move to Sydney, Australia, um, in favor of going onto uh, First Nations land and uh, into Ukrainian settlements in Northern Alberta to, to x-ray people um, to prevent outbreaks. Um, tuberculosis is a drowning. Um, you know, it's, it's your lungs collapsing, something that we're, we're all thinking about a lot lately. Um, and, and so I'm thinking about these connections of, of body and place and, and, and how water works into that. And, and I find that that's really inundating my writing. That's really, really coming into it. Um, I won't go on and on about that, but um, I, I, think, I think it's a search for home. I think it's a search for, for sort of trying to, to connect meaning. And when I can't do that with things that are immediately familiar, I look for something familiar. And I think the movement of water is that. The movement of people is that, and the movement of water in people. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm making sense or if I've gone too far off topic here, but um, but it's about it's about home and it's about it's about personal history for me this week. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Uh, no, there is no on topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Madeline, I'm going to ask you, uh, you have a question for Nick, I believe. And thank you for persisting despite the power being off and getting back on on your phone. That's all right. Um, yeah, rather exciting. So if I'm in, in the dark a little bit, the power's off and it's going to be off until half past seven tonight, apparently. Mm -hmm. so that's good. Anyway, um, back to water, though. Um, Nick, I had several questions kind of prepared for you. One was about the structure of the paper nautilus um, shell in relation to the temporality um, of paper nautilus. But actually, I think I'm going to go in a slightly different direction and ask you about um, how these two precious objects circulate in, in the novel. And I'm thinking about the paper nautilus on one hand and the St. Christopher charm on the other. Mm. Um, so yeah, feel free to comment on the sort of structure of the shell within this question as well. Um, but I'm thinking about the way that both objects come to the family, come to the town or come back to the family um, in Wooker through ocean, the ocean or ocean voyages and how they pass between different people um, and what that kind of does in terms of their, their stories. Mm. Oh, thank you, Madeline. That's a nice question. Um, I think for me in a lot of my writing it starts with an object and you know it's like a, a source of power and then the stories that are generated around that, where it's come from, where it's been, whose hands it's moved through, um, is just something that is always a, a generative principle for me, it's very often the starting point of a story and it's very often the end point of a story. Um, now, why that is, um, I can't really say. Um, it's just how it is. Uh, but the idea of the, the circle mm -hmm. and the change that happens as the circle is inscribed, you know, which is more like a spiral than a complete yeah. circle, is something um, that, that intrigues me. And I guess it's also to do with the survival of things through time and transmission, often um, accidental, haphazard, random, you know, what, what is left, the rack, um, um, again, um, as, as a thematic. Um, so that's how, how I would answer that question. Um, and often um, it can, for me, it can be a story that's coming from somewhere else and is the pressing against or um, submerging up through a sort of surface narrative. 
So it's a kind of opening um, at the same time. So thanks, thanks for that question. Um, mm -hmm. Mandy, I would love to ask um, Jennifer a question, if I can sort of wear another hat. Does, I know that, you does that upset your what, plan? <laughs> kind of does, because I'm worried that we won't ask each writer a question. I really want us to get so that people can ask each other questions, but can we just keep going through, hang on to that okay. question? If we're not sure. all passing out from Zoom fatigue, we'll do that. <laughs> so I've got a question for Kim, and I know other people haven't, haven't read your stories. They may have read your art criticism, though. Um, but I was really interested in the story you sent me early in the year, Little Packets of Sunshine, and you, you talk... You do a lot of stuff with proper nouns and names. All you, you repeat a lot of, or you don't repeat them, but you list a lot of proper names in that story, and it's very powerful. And one of the things you do is list the names of South Sea Islander families up and down the coast, and you describe them as like a reef of wrecked slave trading ships up and down that coast. And I wonder if you'd just like to expand on that image a little. Yeah, I guess this was that story is meant to be a sort of foundation story for a, a collection um, which is sort of talking about, you know, me as a South Sea Islander and how I know the world through my South Sea Islander um, ways. Um, and part of that is talking about the genealogies, talking about as you travel through country, you know, you, you talk about the families that you visit you name the families as you go, as just as blackfellas do too. And um, but the shipwreck thing was kind of about, you know, the names of the families that belong that we uh, associate with particular towns are associated. You know, those towns have a population because there was a sugar mill there. So, you know, they came on particular different families came on particular boats or or you know came through particular ports to. Um, um, you know, be spread amongst all of Queensland. So, so that's where that kind of idea came from, really, that kind of thinking about colonialism and, you know, leaving its detritus everywhere. Um, and not that the people are detritus, but the ships and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was just thinking about those things. But it was also about, you know, kind of affirming... Um, you know, um, what I see is important to South Sea culture and, and, and kind of, you know, kind of reclaiming our indigeneity in a sense, not to claim sovereign lands of um, Aboriginal people here, but how we know and be in the world. And, and it's by knowing who those families are, knowing who, which country you're on, you know, knowing those names that belong to actually a particular place, like the language of the names, you know, like my grand, my great grandfather's name, nobody else has that name. It belongs to a particular village in a, on a particular island. So, you know, knowing that meant that my mother could go back to that island and find our village um, and to be the first ones to return just with one, with her grandfather's name. So yeah, that's where that kind of was, or coming from. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Yeah, all that stuff about Tanaman and, you know, like actually literally naming the islands. Um, am I putting you on the spot, Theo, if I <laughs> ask if you've got a question for Rachel? I'm going to let Nick have his question in a minute, but. I'm, I'm happy to trade questions with Nick for, um, later on and he can have my spot okay. and I will I'll happily ask. Um, okay. Rachel, Thank Rachel, you. question. Oh, I am. Um, hi, Rachel. I, I so enjoyed the poems that were set in and around um, Katitanda, um, which I read in your collection at the floor in the in the pattern. Um, my question, which you kind of touched on um, in your introduction, was about how you encounter southern waters uh, in forms that we might not ordinarily expect. You spoke a lot about aridity and the absence, um, but uh, some of the figures that, that emerged for me were the encrusting salt, you know, the memories of water and, the, and um, that the promise of flood to come, you know, states of anticipation. Um, 
I, I don't know, I suppose if perhaps you could speak to one of those, to one of those figures, um, or, you know, water, water beyond, um, the, you know, knowing it as, as wet and liquid, you know, states of dry evaporation. Is that, I hope there's something there. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, I found, well, that area is just um, incredibly rich for, um, for writing about water and the absence and um, and also uh, the, its presence with um, bringing with it a feeling of um, of of interdependence and and, and really um, it's not until you see that landscape in in um, in flood that um, it really um, it begins to make it, it begins to make sense and that I, what I was trying to to get across or touch on with the, the structure of those poems was the interrelated, not just the interrelated nature of, um, of um, the, the water and geology and, and biological life, but also the, um, um, how uh, the, those particular elements um, work in different ways. Like the, um, the poem sequence is, uh, is structured so that um, each of the poems, um, the following poem begins with um, mm -hmm. the line that concluded the poem before, but read in a um, in a different way, sort of um, bouncing off uh, potential uh, like different meanings of the words. So I was try that was I was trying to show how um, yeah that that waters are obviously uh, are very important for seed germination and for um, and for bringing in bird life but there's also the way in which it stimulates um, insect life that has been lying um, yeah um, embedded in the salt for yeah for many many years and um, and so there's that um, I was hoping to sort of get across as well the way um, uh, that these um, there are um, micro cycles but also um, macro cycles so um, and just and and the way um, uh, as, as humans we respond to um, the turning of that particular cycle with feelings of um, of solace when the water and and joy and um, um, and feelings of plenty and pl um, replenishment when the water eventually comes but those are interspersed with um, yeah um, cycles where we're waiting and um, there's that um, having have patience and knowing that um, that it will eventually turn but with climate change these cycles are also um, the timing of them is also changing and so there are um, yeah there are feelings of, um, of, of des desperation when um, when the land is in its arid cycle for what feels like a, an extended period of time and yeah, those really interesting, um, uh, the concept of solastalgia and, um, and grief for passing of landscapes. And I mean, that I don't really deal with it in the, in the Caddy Tanda cycle, but um, uh, in other work, I, yeah, I, that is coming more and more into play. Um, those, um, the way in which uh, flood and aridity, uh, yeah, climate change is exacerbating uh, those situations. And so um, it's not just um, as, as humans, we're experiencing uh, grief and anxiety over it, but um, there are also um, all of the other, uh, all of the other interconnected species are, are um, experiencing that stress as well in other ways. So, mm. so that really, no, that was great, especially as you connected it to the emotional um, response to water and uh, and aridity. Um, given that seems to be where you're uh, uh, exploring uh, at the moment in your work, so that was that was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Nick. You get your chance to ask Jennifer a question, <laughs> uh, unless someone else has a question no, for no, Jennifer. No. no, no, we did, but you go. Oh, well, it, it's about abandonment. Um, you spoke, it was so interesting hearing you talk about abandonment, the sea abandoning the land, the, the abandoned children, the companies abandoning their responsibility for rem remediation. Um, and I just, it's just a lateral connection because there's also been a lot of talk about islands in this discussion. 
Um, and, you know, the classic, one of the classic images of abandonment is being abandoned on an island. Um, so do you think, you know, the novel itself um, is becoming a kind of island? Mm. A space of abandonment, you know? Um, well, I think the abandonment stuff in my work really comes from, I'm kind of obsessed with accountability um, and accountability failures. And that comes up a lot with the kind of climate stuff. And in that sense, yeah, maybe novels are failing to hold our society to account and hold our society to a, a mirror. Um, but it depends what kind of novels you're talking about. Um, are we talking about white European literary fiction? Are we talking about science fiction? Are we talking about uh, African American literature or Caribbean literature? Like this, it's such a vast, you know, maybe we're an archipelago and not an island. Yeah, yeah. There's such a vast diversity within, you know, we're not talking about one thing when we talk about the novel. Yeah. Um, I loved Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, and mm. um, the fact that that came out when I was really struggling in the last kind of couple of years of working on dyschronia, it really anchored me in that project and was like, yes, yes, there's a need for this. But I was also quite upset with him for saying literature isn't dealing with the climate, isn't dealing with the future, because I read a lot of science fiction and I read a lot of like diverse writing and a lot of writers are kind of struggling with this stuff. I do think it's the writer's role to hold your culture to account, especially in a settler colonial state um, on stolen land. It, it's, you can't tell stories here without acknowledging that. Um, so it's first principle stuff for me. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was, that's good. Um, Meg, I'm going to get you to ask a question of Lucy. Yeah, I'm going to follow straight on to that last point that Jennifer made about holding your culture to account, um, which is what the, um, Salt Creek has obviously invested in doing, um, telling that story of settlement and unsettlement. Um, I'm really interested in how it's shaped, how that story is shaped by the very unique environment of the Quran. But also, um, and yeah, I want to take that point you made, Jennifer, about culture very, right? you know, literally holding a culture to account. I'm really interested in how your novel sets up a certain failure to see this landscape. Um, a failure that's related both to an aesthetic that's been reported and imposed on it from another place, as well as a failure that's, that I think you relate to a certain construction of the sea. Um, so you have this wonderful description of the Kurong as this salt burn bleached world. And you have this mother who is always hankering instead after the lost green world of, of England and looking out over the window, out of the window and just and, and not able to, to, to see the world in front of her and the family can't see the world. And you at some point just said that she's, you know, she look, she's always looking out of the window as if on a ship at a stormy sea, which may also think about you know, the extent to which I wonder, you know, the, 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 the maritime empire, starting with, with, with the Dutch East India Company that, you know, Matt writes about in, in, in his a book, a novel set, set in, in, in um, South Korea called Typhoon Kingdom. You know, they, the, the first thing they do is to construct the sea as an empty place, as an empty space, as an empty surface, as a um, moral liberum, as a, and that, that's something of a sort of necess necessary prelude, I think, to constructing the land as terra nullius. So you have in a way, you know, all these gazers that get trained on this long sea voyage, trained at sea as what they think to be just the surface, not seeing this busy board of the sea. And, 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 you know, and that's why I'm sort of holding Max's book as counterpoint, because he gives us a bit of that undersea world um, up through, through women divers and through fisher folk, because of a busy sea. Um, so, 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 you know, Lisa, I just actually wanted to ask you to talk a bit about that perceptual mismatch. And we do have your narrative framed by Cecilia and Chichester, from which is looking back to this wet world to this very this bone bleached world I'm very interested in. Lucy's still with us. Yes, unmute. Yeah, I've just done. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. This compartmentalizing was something that I was very conscious of um, all the time I was writing. Um, and I, uh, I think there is a kind of temptation for people to think that people were ignorant, and somehow that excuses this. Um, excuses the way people behaved that they they only saw the world in a particular way so mama only saw the failure of the Kurong to be England um and uh papa uh, saw saw its failure to become England and and th those were his failures um but but what really struck me when I was reading about it was that people understood this dichotomy that they lived within. They understood uh, the, the damage that they were causing um, and went ahead and did it and performed that damage repeatedly again and again. And, and that is seen not only at that kind of very domestic level it's through these, these moments of um, colonisation, but uh, came through all of this kind of discourse, from, including from Charles Darwin, who, you know, could say triumphantly, we cannot help but regard the English, it's this kind of vision of them bestriding the oceans and uh, um, holding their flag up for, the, for empire. But say in the same book, uh, a few pages later, no good has ever come of white men, Europeans, um, invading other shores. He doesn't use the word invading, but that's what he effectively means. Um, so I think it, it, it's this, this compartmentalising characterised all of their thinking. And, um, you know, there are various times where Mama, the mother in the in Salt Creek, is terribly concerned about social mores and um, the the girls walking around unattended by uh, any male who would who would keep them safe as if someone was going to gossip about them being unaccompanied out on this wild southern ocean beach and um and the girls say oh you know mama it's not king william street i think we're you know we'll be okay um but they they seem to manage this uh this kind of ongoing lie that they that they all inhabit and that they agree mutually to inhabit um, and, and to lie as well, not only about the damage that they're causing, the acute damage, um, but about all of the kind of ongoing consequences of those things. Um, sorry, can you remind me of a couple of the other things that you said? Oh, sorry, you're muted. No, that's good. You know, I was just really asking about that, um, you know, the inability to see that this is somebody else's land, partly because you're looking at it through aesthetic frameworks that are imported and inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you look at it and you think there's nothing here because you can't see the water sucks because you're looking for all this, you know, surface water that we know from the picturesque mm -hmm. tradition and so forth. So you look up, there's nothing in this landscape, there's nothing happening. How, you know, the extent to which I suppose it's a similar point that, um, you know, Gosh makes about the novel and climate change, you know, how much is the novel form or a certain yeah. aesthetic form actually yeah. you know implicated in and perhaps it goes back to some of the things that, that Michelle was talking about implicated in um, this um, this um, dispossession of the land this degradation of the land precisely because it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like yeah and I think that's so it's such an interesting thing what Jennifer was saying about that holding to account that that we kind of are thinking increasingly I think that literature should do and um which I I kind of worry about the idea of, of literature having utility. I think it's a kind of, it, it is documentary in some ways. It shows a way that we're thinking um, at, um, ways forward. But um, I struggle with the idea that we should expect literature to be driving the kind of change that it is the job of politicians to be doing, especially in terms of uh, climate change. But I understand the idea that that literature will, uh, you know, it raises awareness, um, makes people think about things. But I, I think that the failure of action on climate change or the failure of uh, 
of those kind of cultural reckonings to uh, create change are uh, they, they're sort of rough on literature in some ways. Um, I think that it's really important to look at those reckonings, uh, to explore them, to raise them as issues, but, but not to have enormous expectations about what they're capable of driving. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Look, if you've got the stamina, we've got a few minutes left, and I wonder if, if the, the writers present would like to start asking each other things or making your own comments. Um, just jump in, I think, at this stage. Just unmute yourself and jump in. I'm just going to jump in. It's Kim. Um, when we started, it was blazing hot sun here. It was like 32 degrees and now, now the storm's coming in. So the whole time we've um, been talking, I've had about 40 um, emergency <laughs> notices. Oh, so okay. We're looking forward to the next um, instalment of heavy, heavy rain. I don't know if you see that the, the room's gone dark and all that. Mm. So I might actually jump off because yeah. I'm going to go and batten down the hatches. <laughs> you go and do that, Kim, and thank you so much. And we look forward to your reading tomorrow night. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks, See you. And anyone else who needs to go, please go. But otherwise, we've got about you know, 15 minutes. Hmm. You want to respond, Jennifer? I'd like to say something oh. actually, in response. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to say something in response about to what Lucy was just talking about, about the expectation on literature, um, just in terms of, yeah, like I do, I do think that it's important that writers have the, the freedom to write about whatever they want to write about and that um, I do believe that that's a really important aspect of literature um, uh, but I also feel at the same time that literature is constructing political um, it's constructing political um, oppression and it's oppressing people. Um, and that has a very real impact on people's lives and bodies. And that's really interesting to um, look at ways that uh, that can be reorientated because I think that's something that perhaps in a way in, in, in the aesthetic realms that we've worked as writers and the way that it's been taught, the teaching of literature, um, but uh, we uphold those values as being important um, uh, that, that, that maybe we overlook, you know, the way in which it's actually um, oppressed people. Thanks, Michelle. Some of us like to think we teach in ways that <laughs> explore those things too, as I'm sure you know. Um, does somebody else want to, would you, do you want to respond, Jennifer? Or? Uh, just to say that um, I don't have high expectations that literature is going to change the world on its own. That's, that wasn't my, my point. I think that... Um, Changing the narrative is part of changing the world. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a world of narratives that were pretty broken for me. Um, people like me didn't exist or didn't deserve to exist. Um, the entire history of the country I live on was just made up. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that we're not doing right. And you see, um, when I talk about accountability and Lucy, you were saying these like, characters of yours seeing what they're doing wrong knowing it's wrong and then going ahead and doing it anyway all I can think about is the coal industry and all I can think about is Scott Morrison at COP26 and we've got exactly the same problem mm. so we have to shift the narrative we have to understand why people keep making the same mistake yeah no for sure and is that I mean there's no shortage of people who who think exactly that 
but it is how to enact that change into the in the people who um who have that control I guess this is that's the the element that I struggle with that kind of shift mm. that knowledge into the people who can who can do something but um, we can all do something I think we all have to work where we are for sure yeah, and my workplace happens to be books, so <laughs> that's where I'm focusing. Yeah. Do you want to say that, Meg? Oh, I was just um, thinking of, I can't remember who used the phrase habits of thought earlier, but you know, perhaps rather than thinking of a very direct instrumental action, the one way of thinking how literature acts in the world is as a training as in certain habits of thought, or inculcating certain habits of thought, or breaking certain habits of thought, when you get that shock of a new novel that forces you to, or poem that forces you to think differently, and that's that's where I locate the power of it. Um, I'd like to come back to something that Rachel said about affect. Um, Rachel sort of partly apologised for mentioning that weather has these inspires in us, sometimes profound affects, um, desire or anxiety or, and it might have been Meg, you flashing up Matthew's The Cover of the Typhoon Kingdom, you know, which I recommend. It's such a fantastic novel, such a fine book. Um, but, but I think this is something that, that um, and it's very embedded in Jennifer's work, I think, that, that uh, and indeed in, in Lucy's elegy for the, you know, what, what Salt does. <laughs> And, and the depredations that we're all dealing with in relation to not just oceanic spaces, but you know, land spaces. And I, I'd really like to hear um, what other writers think about how we figure affect in our thinking. And I, I see how brilliantly poets do it. I see how Jill and Rachel you know, were, were using that. But I find this uh, almost an ethical challenge uh, not not to devote everything to the sort of narrative movement or the the narrative excitements, but but to keep that really volatile, difficult space of affect there, which includes for me elegy. I wonder if anyone wants to comment on this. So I think um, like elegy, and, I mean narrative. The problem with narrative is 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 this is this is the structural imposition of onto onto a text, onto language, um, and that in a way is an inherent problem for for writers. I think in because it's creating borders. It's creating boundaries, um, and it's trying to enclose meaning, and it's trying to enclose identity. So that I think um, is that what you're kind of referencing, Gail? Uh, no, I, I'm um, I'm quite devoted to the novel. I, I don't think of the novel as an imposition. I think of it as a um, a way of thinking. That, that I think it's a space for thinking. So I don't have a problem with the imposition of a narrative, what you call imposition, um, with, with the construction of a narrative. I think we do this every day and we have narratives to contest and narratives to endorse. I guess I was wondering about a word like feeling uh, and, and desire and, and even gender, the words that haven't sort of turned up in the conversation and how, um, um, sorry, this is not a well-framed question. Um, it, it seems to me that that the ingenuity of poetry is a more open space than for novel, and I'm not sure why this is so, and I don't know if it's simply that uh, it's November and we're all a bit tired uh, or grief-stricken in different ways, but I, I'm just wondering if someone else has a response to this. I suppose I have um, been the poet, or well, one of the poets, there's a few poets here, um, to, yeah, to think about um, something that's um, 
goes alongside narrative or doesn't sit outside it because you're right Gail everyone has their own narrative that's going on in their head every day or their story that's going along but um, to and I mean I know a lot is talked about these days about hybrid forms of writing but it seems that if you start um, with the focus on language that poetry has it allows you to um, uh, move a, around a little bit more with experimenting with the language um, and yeah Meg asked me a particular question um, which I probably didn't answer terribly well about experimenting with language but um, I have been sitting here trying to as I was listening to myself and everyone else speak and I'm glad that you raised the question of gender and I'm also thinking about sexuality um, is that when I think obviously about my life and then my writing um, it's not a stable thing you know there's no sort of you know um, binary operating for me and then when you think of water flow um, flow and interruption um, certainly there's you know I guess a queering of waters if you want to put it like that and um, I've been trying to somehow say something clear and I can't say it clearly about that but for me there's something going on in that um, and um, I guess um, thinking about um, emotions and feelings um, I've slightly sort of sidetracked a little bit but I'll probably come back I'm interested in the idea of thirst um, because thirst um, obviously can be desire as well as literal thirst and thinking about everything such as the oceanic salt and we've explored that a bit obviously in Lucy's um, ideas and what Rachel was saying um, as well um, and what I guess the poet can do about trying to look at those after things and between things about detritus and rack bringing all of that into the work that maybe um and i'm not a novelist although i have i've actually written a novel it's under the bed somewhere i will never reveal it um that, that maybe might interrupt a certain narrative but um when you're writing poetry or in hybrid forms that you can um, bring in this detritus, this rack, these after things and between things and interruptions, these thirsts and quenchings um, that you know, sit, perhaps don't sit as well in a narrative. Um, and they might have something to do with language itself as much as what the writing's about. That is, you you get rid of some things and just hope that through an associative um, pressure um, or a spatial pressure, something might um, come of meaning making, even if it's just a personal meaning making or um, meaning making that's not stable. Does that make any sense? No, that, that's very clarifying. Thank you. I was having this conversation with my mum the other day and she's a painter. And she was talking about working on really small scale and how freeing it is because you can just do something really gestural and you don't have to worry about the kind of consistency or the structure. And I was like, oh, that's just the difference between short stories and novels. Mm. It's exactly what it's like. It's gesture for me. Mm. You know, I wonder if... Um if the questions that you've raised might might be um, also connected to, to what Lucy mentioned about talking to a psychologist friend who said, you know, wa well, water is always emotion. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think I was trying to articulate this with this idea of home, that there's a nostalgia present in, in writing about water for me, no matter how I embrace it. And, and I'm also thinking a little bit about how that ties into what Meg raised about, um, you know, going going beyond the surface and and really sort of seeking out um, a, a more immersive knowledge and and the way that 
engaging with emotion and, and engaging with this kind of immersive knowledge. Um, Arundhati Roy in, in um, The God of Small Things has this character, Rahel, who, who I think calls it a, um, a fish swimming sense, like this kind of, um, yeah, a, a immersive knowledge and connection. Um, and, and I wonder if, I wonder if we're a little bit afraid of nostalgia. I wonder if we're a little bit afraid of admitting that emotion is a, a key driver in our work. What, what do we think about that? I guess it is that source of um, energy in a lot of ways, isn't it? It is that thing that you tap into, that well, that brings forth a whole lot of stuff. And uh, I, I, I mean, I know we all work in different ways, but um, uh, for me, the minute my conscious self is out of the way of what I'm doing, a lot of imagery that connects to other related imagery emerges and I get quite a coherent web that forms. But if I try and do that consciously, it is this kind of horrific Meccano structure um, that is grotesque and uh, unbelievable in all ways. Um, but I think that that emotion um, is that conduit in some ways. I wouldn't say that absolutely, only that, that that's how it would happen for me, probably. But it's interesting, we even use water terms to talk about that creative process. Mm. You're in the flow, right? Like, mm. Yeah. Mm. And I was interested in, Jen Jennifer, the, the, um, the reference you made to gesture and certainly in painting and then picking up on emotion that, you know, our bodies do gesture, whether we you know, know that they're doing it or not, and expressing emotion, but also um, getting back to what Gail was saying and then I was responding to, was um, I've been quite interested in um, the idea of following the brush. I've just come, um, you know, reconnected with this idea, which is a, a Japanese form, zuhitsu, um, uh, although one of the, you know, quite, old pieces of work, the pillow book, is um, based around this idea of simply following thought and therefore hybrid forms such as a kind of poetic essay where you could write a, um, a little bit of a narrative and then go into a list of something and, and just following um, the forms of thought um, and I guess thought, um, you know, in the broader sense of emotion and response to what's going on um, is, and getting back to what Meg was asking me, it's an, another thing that I'm starting to be drawn to of sort of, I guess, the poetry essay and just going with it and seeing what happens. And yes, we, we've used terms like flow, stream, well, um, and all those sorts of things that we can't really help it. I don't know if it's a Western thing, I'm not sure. Are these Western tropes? Yes, good question. I'm going to bring us to a halt there. Um, found this extraordinarily rich. Thank you all so much for giving your time and for taking part in this conversation. It's been wonderful.